The signs of the times indicate that we are on the threshold of the tribulation, a time of unparalleled carnage here upon the earth. What is the purpose of the tribulation? When will it begin? How long will it last? And why would God allow such carnage to occur? For the answers to these questions and many others concerning the tribulation, stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. My colleague Nathan Jones and I are going to discuss today a period of time that the Bible pictures as the worst period in the history of the world. And one of the names the Bible gives it is the Tribulation. Well, Nathan, let's jump right into this. What is the Tribulation and uh, what are its purposes? Well, the tribulation we have to think about is not the daily sufferings that we go through. Many Christians around the world are suffering immensely, either being persecuted by ISIS or illegally being shut out or, or being considered second class citizens or even the daily traumas that we go through in life, our, our sufferings because of man and Satan or even that we put upon ourselves because of our sin nature. The Bible when it talks about tribulations, that's, think of it as a lower case T tribulation. Yes. But when prophecy talks about the tribulation, think of it as the all uppercase capped the tribulation. It is like the flood, it is a time where God judges the world because of its sins. And that time will come in the future where God will again judge the world for its sins just like the flood. And isn't there a special uh, purpose in the tribulation that relates to the Jewish people? Oh, definitely. I believe actually there's four purposes, main purposes okay. for the tribulation. Yeah. We talked about the wrath of God. It gets like a cup that fills up and it's about to overflow. God's anger is, he's very patient, but his wrath eventually pours out when his anger reaches that limit. And God's anger will finally come out upon the world in what's called the, the day of the Lord. Uh, that is the first thing. It's a punishment for sin. Two, it's also to bring a remnant of the Jewish people back to know Jesus as their Savior. Uh, by the end of the tribulation, we know that two thirds of the Jews will be killed tragically in a second Holocaust. But when Jesus returns, they will look up at heaven and they will weep and wail and they will realize that Jesus is the Messiah and they will give their lives to Him. Third is that Gentiles too will come to know the Lord as their Savior. The Bible talks about martyrs from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people standing before the throne of God and worship again. So we know many Gentiles will come to know the Lord through the tribulation as well. And the fourth reason, I think this is the main reason for the tribulation, Jesus returns. It's the second coming. He comes back to earth. He defeats Satan and the Antichrist, and He sets up His kingdom for a thousand years. So that would be the four reasons for the tribulation. Well, I appreciate that, and, and uh, you're right about those four reasons. One of the reasons I mentioned the Jewish people is because in Daniel 9, and Daniel says there's going to be a period of 490 years, mm -hmm. uh, 70 weeks of years, in which God is going to deal with the Jewish people and try to accomplish some very specific purposes, and one of the most important being the salvation of a great remnant of the Jewish people. And uh, that clock stopped ticking uh, when Jesus died on the cross and the Jewish people refused to accept Him as their Messiah. Uh, there was, what, 483 years up to that point. And this last seven years has been put off. It's like you called a timeout in a football game. Mm -hmm. And that last seven years is waiting. And that is the seven years of this tribulation. And so there's going to be a special focus upon the Jewish people during that time. But uh, also, uh, half the people on the planet Earth, according to the book of Revelation, are going to die during that time. It's not just the Jewish people. No. Uh, but, the, but the point that you made that I want to emphasize is that even when God pours out His wrath, His fundamental purpose is to bring people to repentance that they might Amen. be saved. What Amen. a God of grace that is. It is. It is. It, you know, some people, they really need to get down on their knees. Life has to be as hard as it can be before they finally surrender their lives to Jesus Christ. And that's what the world is like. The world right now is shaking its fist at God. You know, we're seeing it in the United States, especially this great yeah. oh, spirit of rebellion. Spirit of rebellion of, going on. Yes. A great spirit of Antichrist, as the Bible calls it. And it will get, need to, they'll need to see first the rapture of the church as the church is taken out. And then we get into a time period that leads up to the tribulation. 
And Daniel 9, 27 tells us that the tribulation begins when a one world ruler ascends and makes a peace covenant with Israel, right. Daniel 9, 26 and 27. And that starts Daniel's 70th week. Like you said, that extra seven years that particularly are meant for the Jewish people. It's a blessing that the Gentiles come to salvation during that time too. But I totally agree that Daniel's 70th week prophecy is primarily about the Jewish people, bringing them a remnant back to know Jesus. Now you keep Savior. talking about people coming to the Lord during that period of time. How is that going to happen when the church we believe is going to be taken out before all this starts? Right. Uh, you and I, we're definitely strong believers that the rapture is pre-tribulational, that Jesus defends and protects His church. We're not subject to His wrath, 1 Thessalonians 1.10 and 5.9. So, how do people get saved with the church? Well, we don't need the church there. And clearly when you read through Revelation, the church isn't there. It, the tribulation, we're here at the church in the beginning and the end, but not in the middle. But God doesn't leave the people of the tribulation without the gospel. He leaves in the first half the, what's called the two witnesses. at the, And they're in Jerusalem and they're preaching and, and the world hates them and they want them dead and the Antichrist will end up killing them. We also have the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Jewish people that will come to be Lord, and they'll be like all Billy Grahams. You know, they'll be, <laughs> as you always say, they'll be super preachers. He'll also have a gospel angel near the end of the tribulation who will go around the world, and everybody will get the gospel. That's amazing to me that it says that right at the end of the tribulation, God's going to send forth an angel to circumnavigate the globe and proclaim the gospel to every person right before he pours out his final wrath. That's really grace. It is, it is. And I think a lot of the materials we create, this TV show, everything yeah. that we put online okay. will for a while. Well, I was going to come back at you on that because okay. you mentioned the two witnesses, you mentioned the gospel angel, yes. uh, you mentioned the, the 144,000, uh, you uh, mentioned the, the wrath itself because wrath mm -hmm. often causes people to come to repentance. But you didn't mention the Word of God. Amen. I mean, the Bible is still going to be here. It's going to be all over the place. In fact, I, I have right at the front of my Bible, what must you do to be saved? And I hope that everyone watching will take the time to write right in the front of their Bible, what must you do? Because people are not going to have a lot of time to sit down and study during the tribulation. No, no. They no. need to be able to be directed to the verses that will show them how they can relate to Jesus Christ and be saved. Because the Bibles are going to be everywhere. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, we'll still have the internet, and, and you've put a lot of resources there. And it's going to take a lot of time for the uh, for the Antichrist to get all this stuff down, and, and, and when we've got it here, there, and everywhere. There are thousands of Bible apps that people can download right now. So, we don't even need the paper. They can carry them with them. But, right, the Antichrist will try to purge the Gospel out because he wants the world to worship him, especially at the midpoint of the Tribulation and on. But, yeah, we've got the Bible. And our ministry has left many materials behind, even a left behind video to help yes. people who they see the rapture and are left behind. Now, you mentioned that the Tribulation is going to begin when the Antichrist signs a treaty with Israel. Uh, what makes you think it's going to be a peace treaty? Because in Daniel 9 it mentions this treaty, but it doesn't say it's a peace treaty. It just says it's a, a treaty of some sort. Or so a covenant. Why, yeah. yeah, and why, why do we think it might be a peace treaty? Well, in the middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist breaks the covenant. He goes into the newly built temple. There is no third temple right now on the Temple Mount. There's right. the Dome of the Rock right now, the Islamic uh, mosque there. And he desecrates a temple. He then has the world. He declares that they should worship him. And so he's breaking a treaty that allows the Jewish people to rebuild the temple. Well, how can the Jewish people yeah. rebuild a temple unless there's some kind of peace between them and the Muslims? Yes. I believe the war of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39, which happens at, just before at the onset of the tribulation, will end the world of the Islamic threat. But somehow the Antichrist is involved in it. He steps into a power vacuum or something. So, there's peace involved in that covenant. Well, I think that's a good inference because we do know the temple is going to be rebuilt. We know the temple can only be rebuilt on the original site. And the Jews believe with all their heart that original site is where the uh, Dome of the Rock sits today on the Temple Mount. So, something's got to happen to the Dome of the Rock. Yeah, Perhaps it's, it's going to be destroyed in the Psalm 83 war, the Gog and Magog war. And we know that uh, the temple is going to be rebuilt. So, there has to be some sort of treaty, a peace treaty, that the, where the Antichrist is guaranteeing the peace of Israel and allowing them to rebuild their temple, which he goes into in the beginning, at the, in, in the middle of the tribulation, and declares himself to be God. Yeah. At which point the Jewish people totally reject him, and he becomes obsessed with annihilating them in the last half of the tribulation. 
Jesus referred to the last half of the tribulation as the great, great tribulation, tribulation, but he referred to that that way because he was speaking to the Jewish people. And that's when their tribulation is going to be. Mm -hmm. But many people have taken that and said, well, that means the first half of the tribulation is going to be very peaceful. <laughs> the Bible <laughs> doesn't indicate that. It no. indicates there's going to be constant war escalating probably into a nuclear war in which one half the, of, of the Gentiles on planet Earth are going to be killed during the first half of the tribulation. There's no peace during this whole thing. No, not at all. And you mentioned about the pouring out of God's wrath. I'd, I'd like to close out this particular session with a reading from the book of Nahum. Because, uh, you know, Billy Graham's often said that if God doesn't uh, uh, judge San Francisco soon, uh, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, listen what it says in the book of Nahum, chapter 1, verse 2. A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries. He reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, but the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. The day of wrath is coming. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy and our discussion of the Tribulation. Nathan, let's get right into the central figure of the Tribulation. He's called the Antichrist. Who in the world is he? <laughs> Who in the world is he? Okay. Well, he will be one of ten kings who either rise from Europe or the world will be partitioned into ten regions, mm -hmm. not sure which. But he will rise up and he will overthrow three and he will then become the head of a new government. The government will then stretch out and eventually encompass the whole world. So the world at some point, likely because of the destruction uh, and the chaos that comes from the rapture, uh, the war of Gog and Magog where God supernaturally steps in and destroys the Islamic countries of the Middle East and Russia. But he rises from Europe, he takes power, and eventually he becomes the leader of the world. And Satan rules the world through this man. Why do you keep saying that he comes out of Europe? Well, when you read uh, Daniel 9, it says that he will come from the people who will destroy the temple. And the people who destroyed the temple were the Romans. Right. And so we know then that the Antichrist will arise out of the Roman era. Yes, that's very important. That's in uh, Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26, where it says that the people who destroy the temple will be the people of the Antichrist. Yeah, in and 70 AD, the Romans destroyed the temple. That's right. Uh, could he be a Muslim? Well, that's a very popular theory now because Islam is so prevalent right now. And it appears by all statistics and probability that given another 50 years, Islam could take over the world. I don't believe so, for one, because of that verse. It pretty much points out that he will rise out of the Italian or, or area of Europe. But primarily because in the prophetic timeline, there's two wars that likely lead up just to the beginning of the tribulation. You mentioned earlier the Psalm 83 war where Israel has to finally subjugate the countries around them. That but have a common border. That share a common border, like Egypt and um, mm -hmm. Lebanon and Jordan. But then there's also where then as a reaction, the Islamic nations in outer ring, Iran, Turkey, uh, Sudan and all, mm -hmm. join up with this leader named Gog who rules over Russia, and some people today wonder if that's Vladimir Putin, and they will come against Israel and try to destroy it. And God steps in and He not only obliterates their armies, but then He sends fire on their countries and destroy them. Right. Well, that guts Islam in the Middle East, and it shows Allah has no power. And then we read about this one world ruler who steps into the, the fray, and then he goes and he conquers a third of the world. Well, is that Islamic countries? What world are we talking about? So I don't believe, since the Antichrist wants worship for him, that he wants another monotheistic religion to compete with. And so I do not believe that the Antichrist will be a Muslim because it appears at the onset of the tribulation, Islam is pretty much wiped off the earth. Yeah, I would agree with you wholeheartedly on that. At least the Islam in the Middle East at is going to be yeah. eliminated. Uh, I think there's another thing I would throw in there. And that is the fact that we're told by the Apostle Paul that in the middle of the tribulation the Antichrist will go to Jerusalem to that rebuilt temple, go inside and declare himself to be God. No Muslim would ever declare no, himself to be, be God. Killed. And if they'd he did, killed. the Muslims would kill him. Yeah, I'm, that's a wonderful point. That's a wonderful point. And the fact that the Dome of the Rock isn't even there, yeah. and that the Jewish people have full control of the Temple Mount and have a temple, where's Islam's power? I mean, you can't even send a Jew up on the Temple Mount without riots worldwide. Also, another thing that occurs to me is what Jewish leader in his right mind is going to put enough trust in a Muslim to for some peace treaty. I mean, no, no, no. Uh, They're going to look for somebody outside of the country that's right, that's and outside right. of what is their hated enemies. Uh, Do you think the uh, Antichrist is alive today? 
Well, I believe, and you've done so much work on it, check out our website, Signs of the Times, especially your article, 50 Reasons, and it shows so many signs of point that we are coming to the soon return of Jesus at the rapture. And if that's the case, and if we are really near that time, and we've seen Israel, the fig tree rebutted, it's back in the land, and we're the generations that seen that happen. I believe firmly that the Antichrist probably is out there. I'm not saying that he's already a, people are always saying that he's the president. He's like President Obama or President Trump now or, or any, but. <laughs> whoever he, they don't like. Whoever they don't like. But he's probably, you know, a low, he probably doesn't even know he's the Antichrist oh, one yeah. day because he will end up being uh, possessed by Satan in the midpoint of the tribulation. And he might not even be alive. He might be run by Satan. So he's. Well, you know, I, I, Satan knows Bible prophecy. Oh, in and out. Uh, the in reason and out. He, uh, one thing is, Book of Revelation says that right in the middle of the tribulation, that he tries to take God's throne one last time, and he's cast down to earth, and he comes down in great anger because he knows his time is short. So he knows Bible prophecy, but he doesn't know God's timing. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know when God's going to to implement all these end time things. So I believe that throughout history. Satan has always had an antichrist candidate, somebody he is ready to groom and to move on the scene. As soon as God makes his move, he'll make his move. So I think he has a candidate right now, somewhere, some person uh, that uh, he could move very quickly and put into the position. And we know he's going to be possessed by uh, Satan. So it, it's very interesting that he might always have had a candidate and he might have one right now. If the tribulation is pretty much Satan finally getting what he wants and ruling the earth, but he knows Bible prophecy, why does Satan do it? I mean, he knows he's going to be defeated. Why do you think that he goes ahead with fulfilling Bible prophecy knowing that he's going to be defeated? I think he's, he's self-deceived. Self-deceived. And self-deception is the greatest deception of all. I think he truly believes that somehow he's going to be able to be victorious. <laughs> uh, Typical narcissist. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, throughout much of history, uh, Christian theologians have taught that the Antichrist would be a Jew, and they've really emphasized this because it was part of the uh, anti-Semitic attitude of the church, which prevailed throughout most of church history and even is predominant in replacement theology today. Do you think that the Antichrist might be a Jew? Well, you, you hear that, you know, especially uh, especially those who follow the Muslim Antichrist view. The Dajjal is supposed to be a Jew with one eye and the word infidel <laughs> on his forehead, and as if that's Bible prophecy. It's not. It's it was 600 years before you know Jesus was born, or after, excuse me. But uh, no, I don't, because when you get to Revelation 13. Revelation 13 describes the Antichrist and it describes the false prophet. And the Antichrist is described as the beast that rises out of the sea. And that is always a pointer that that is a sea is separate from Israel. It's not the land, it's a sea. Now the false prophet. And the sea is used as a symbol of the Gentile nations. Of Gentile yes. nations. He rises out of the Gentile yes. nations. So, no, I don't believe. And the uh, false prophet comes out of the land. The which land. Indicates he might be He Jewish. might. Yeah, he might not be the Pope as some yes. people say, but he might actually be a, a Jewish uh, person who is, he's the PR man for the Antichrist. <laughs> he does the miracles that Satan allows him to do, but uh, he could be Jewish. Yes, and I think it's uh, pretty futile for people to, to speculate today that yeah, the we Antichrist can. might be this person or that person or that person. We'll never know. We're going to be raptured, right? I think we're going to be taken out. We yes. will not know, we'll and I don't know. think the Antichrist will be revealed immediately. I think there's going to be a time between the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation, uh, maybe a short time, but uh, we won't know until he makes that treaty with uh, Israel. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy and our discussion of the Tribulation, its meaning and purpose. Nathan, there are some prophecy teachers out there, thankfully not many, who are teaching that we are in the Tribulation now and have been ever since World War I. How do you respond to that? Are we living in the Tribulation? <laughs> well, I made a video about that, one of the inbox videos. You want to see it? I would love to. Let's show it to them. Okay. There are some Bible prophecy teachers out there who are teaching that we are currently living in the tribulation. All the way back since World War I, they claim, the prophetic judgments of Revelation have been pouring down upon the earth. Sadly, the only thing predictable about their predictions is that they've scared a whole lot of people senseless. 
are we currently living in the tribulation? Let's define tribulation, for there's tribulation, and then there's the tribulation. How one defines tribulation is often tied to where they're coming from. Some people think of tribulation as having to endure. We're obviously not talking about first world problems here. The rest of the world defines tribulation much more severely, such as having to endure. These are the severe trials and afflictions that much of the world suffers from on an ongoing basis. Then there are the Christians, who live under an extra level of persecution. For Jesus warned, If they persecute me, they will also persecute you. Therefore, in the world, you will have tribulation. The world hates Jesus and his moral law, and so will, of course, also hate and persecute his followers. But when talking about tribulation, as Bible prophecy describes, we're not talking about the inevitable day-to-day -day sufferings we all share caused by Satan and our fellow man. Rather, prophecy is talking about an event, the tribulation. The tribulation goes by a number of different names and descriptions in the Old Testament. The day of the Lord the terror of the Lord, a day of reckoning, a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of destruction and desolation, the time of Jacob's distress, the great and terrible day of the Lord. For then there shall be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. Think of modern day movies which often mislabel the tribulation as Judgment Day, Armageddon, and the end of the world. They're close, but woefully nowhere near as intense in scope. God has a fourfold purpose for the tribulation. One, to pour out his wrath upon the nations of the world for all their evil as he did during the flood. Two, to bring multitudes of people to finally accept Jesus as savior. Three, to gather a remnant of Jewish people who finally accept Jesus as Messiah. Four, for Jesus to defeat evil and set up his kingdom. The tribulation will last for seven excruciatingly long years. It begins when the ascending one world ruler, the Antichrist, makes a peace covenant with Israel. The seven years are split into two periods of three and a half years each, with the division occurring when the Antichrist enters into the newly built Jewish temple and declares himself to be God. He then engages in genocide, killing two thirds of the Jews in a second Holocaust. And that's why the second half is often referred to as the Great Tribulation, for it truly is the time of Jacob's trouble. So how do we know we're not currently living in the tribulation? Well, just look out your window. Do you see the following conditions Revelation described? Conditions so horrific that Jesus declared. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. A one world ruler risen to power who rules over a global government. The Antichrist making and breaking a peace covenant with Israel a one-world religious system being implemented, a new world war being waged so great that a quarter of the world's population, almost two billion people, are slaughtered, death by mass starvation and rampant plagues, the worst evils let loose from people's hearts so that they sin exceedingly, violence, theft, and witchcraft are the norm, demons run reckless, no longer obscured, the planet cracked apart by earthquakes, meteors, and fires so that the entire biosphere teeters on the brink of collapse. Christians and Jews hunted down like animals to be slaughtered. The Antichrist's name tattooed on his people's right hand or forehead or face starvation. The world's leaders crawl into caves and cry out for the mountains to fall upon them to protect them from God's anger. When the tribulation begins, the people who are on earth will not have to call anyone to find out for sure whether or not it has begun. The tribulation will be a living hell with a degree of violence that is unparalleled in all of history. Clearly, we're not currently living in the tribulation, but eventually it will come. 
But don't lose hope, for there are people who will not have to endure the horrors of the tribulation. While the tribulation, like the flood was, is God's pouring out of his judgment upon mankind for our sins, believers in Christ are promised exemption from God's wrath. The wrath of God is meant only for those who live in rebellion against him and not for those who have accepted Jesus as Savior. They have kept his command to persevere through the tribulations of this life, and so he will also keep them from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So no matter how bad the world gets today, it is nothing compared to what life will be like during the tribulation. Make sure you never have to face those terrible days, except Jesus' lifeline of salvation. Outstanding job, Nathan. Praise I really appreciate Praise that. And uh, I appreciate particularly the fact that you pointed out in that video that it is not necessary for anyone to go through the tribulation if they'll reach out to Jesus in faith. Amen. And Revelation 3.10 gives us that promise. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world. We have that promise. Yes. Christians are guaranteed protection from the wrath of God. Well, folks, that's our program for this week. I hope it's been a blessing to you. And I hope you'll be back with us again next week, the Lord willing. Until then, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, Look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. Where will the Antichrist come from? Will he be a Jew or a Gentile? Dr. David Reagan's book, The Man of Lawlessness, The Antichrist in the Tribulation, answers these and other questions such as, Could he be a Muslim? Is he alive today? Will he be killed and resurrected? Where will his headquarters be located? Will he actually control the whole world? Will he be possessed by Satan? And will Christians have to face him? Dr. Reagan discusses these compelling topics and even enlists 22 Bible prophecy experts to give their unique perspectives on them. You will not want to miss this opportunity to survey the career of the Antichrist during the coming tribulation. To get your copy of The Man of Lawlessness, The Antichrist in the Tribulation, call the number you see on the screen, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Central Time, and ask for it by name, or go to our website at landlion.com. We can provide you with a copy of this book for a donation of $20 or more. That includes the cost of shipping. Are you living with hope in the end times? Make plans now to attend this year's annual Bible conference and banquet on July 14th and 15th. Speakers include Dr. David Reagan, Don Perkins, Pastor Glenn Meredith, Dr. Tommy Ice, Pastor Andy Woods, and Dr. Ed Heinsen. The conference will be held at the Courtyard Marriott Hotel in Allen, Texas. Put the conference on your calendar and plan to join us for an exciting two days of great Christian music, fellowship, and dynamic teaching. Register at lamblion.com today or by contacting us at 972-736-3567, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Central Time. Hurry, seating is limited. Christ in Prophecy is made possible through the faithful and generous support of viewers like you. Please consider making a donation to Lamb and Lion Ministries so that we can continue broadcasting the message of Jesus' soon return. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus.